Hey guys, uh, let's do chapter two, the chemical basis of life. So, as you probably recall, I've talked a little bit about this before. We had the hierarchy of complexity. You are an organism made up of several organ systems. These organ systems made up of multiple organs. These organs made up of multiple tissues. These tissues being made up of multiple different types of cells. These cells being made up of multiple organelles. Organelles made up of multiple different macromolecules. These macromolecules being made up of smaller molecules. And eventually we get down to the concept of the atom. The atom is the base unit. Okay? The atom is the base unit. Uh, so before we can talk about all the rest of this stuff and, and how we fit into the world around us, we really need to have a good grasp on these atoms, uh, who they are, and how they work. Okay, so I have a chart of things... My son's coming. A chart of things that are very important for us. So let's go through and uh, talk about them, shall we? All right. Matter and energy. This is a super important concept. And it goes as follows. Matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. This is good old-fashioned solids, liquid, and gas. Okay, uh, th this table, that's matter. This phone, that's matter. Okay, uh, matter, it, it occupies space. Energy is not that way, okay? It's different. Uh, energy is basically only tangible in its effects upon matter. Uh, it is the capacity to do work. No mass, no space. Uh, just the ability to do things is governed by energetic efficiency, if you will. Now, in the world of energy, there are two formats. There is kinetic energy and there is potential energy. Kinetic energy being that which is directly involved in doing work, and potential potential energy, which is, in fact, a storage of energy. Okay, storage form. Now, in the world around us, there are three concepts, in you, if you will, in terms of energy that I think are worthy of our conversation, and that is the forms of chemical energy, electrical energy, mechanical energy, and radiant, or electromagnetic energy. Uh, chemical energy is a potential energy, a storage Okay, it's locked up in bonds, and when those bonds break, uh, energy is released. Our fat storage is in our body. That is chemical energy. Uh, if you take a AAA battery and cut that sucker in half, there's this crazy electrolytic fluid inside of there. That is an energy storage fluid. It is chemical energy. Okay, uh, when you go and you eat a hamburger, there is chemical energy in there that you're going to put into your own system to help you run your own metabolism. That is chemical energy. All right, electrical energy. That which flows is particles, okay? Uh, the wires in my house, that's going to have electrical energy flowing through it. In a similar way to the nerves in your body, they have a flow of particles internally as well, and uh, that would be considered electrical energy, a nervous impulse in the grand scheme. Mechanical energy, uh, that is directly involved in motion, in doing work, it is kinetic. Like our buddy Einstein here pedaling his bicycle, that is using mechanical energy directly involved. It is doing the job. And then last but not least is radiant or electromagnetic energy. This travels in waves, all right? This is light of all of its forms. Not just visible light, but light in all of its forms. Like for instance, here we can see an infrared image. Uh, this is showing you uh, radiant energy being emitted by this person. Heat, in essence, is a form of radiant energy. Okay, so we certainly display radiant energy. Uh, and then worthy of our consideration here is the law of conservation of energy. Uh, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It simply changes forms. Okay, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It simply changes forms. And here, uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, a lot later, but I'm going to mention a word that you need to be familiar with, and that word is entropy. Right? Entropy. Now, energy is neither created nor destroyed. Fact. It simply changes form. Fact. But every time you change the form of energy, uh, the laws of the universe dictate that there will be some energy lost in the system. Okay? That is no longer available. Uh, for instance, if you take gas and you put it in your car and you drive your car around, very little of the energy from the gas, which is a form of chemical energy, very little of the energy from that gasoline actually makes the car move. A huge percentage of the energy from the gasoline is lost as heat. That's entropy. 
you're losing usable energy every time you change forms. You take it from a chemical energy gas, turn it into a mechanical energy motion, and you're losing heat via entropy. That means that it is lost from the system uh, and it goes basically back out to the universe around us. You can put your hand on the hood of that car and feel the heat coming off of it and know that this is happening. Um, you do the same thing. So you go and you eat a hamburger. How much of that hamburger turns into motion in your system? Not much. Okay, not much actually becomes usable energy. Well, less than you would think becomes usable energy in your system. A lot of it gets lost as heat through our metabolism. We are exothermic organisms. Every time we move, we generate heat, in essence, from our musculature. That is entropy. That is losing energy from the system. There's a, the, the book definition would be a net loss of usable energy. That is entropy. So, is energy destroyed? No. But do we lose energy from the system every time we use it? Yes, and that's entropy. Entropy. And that's basically heat radiating back out into space. All right. Atoms are the smallest part of an element that displays the properties of that element. Uh, atoms are like hydrogen and helium and new, uh, uh, neon. That's where I was going. Jeez, at first. Uh, these are atoms in the world around us, okay? And they're composed of subatomic particles. Each atom is composed of subatomic particles, these being protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. You need to be familiar with this slide. This slide outlines pretty much everything you really need to know about atoms, protons, neutrons, and electrons. So I'm just going to lay it all on you right now. Uh, you should go through it and then rewind it and do it again, just so you're clear. <clears throat> Alright, let's have a conversation. Atoms, theoretically, would look something like this. There's a central nucleus, and then all around it would be electrons in a cloud. The electrons are around the outside, and the protons and neutrons are on the inside. The protons and neutrons are what we call the nucleus, okay? Protons and neutrons, basically, they have mass. They're really heavy, so they stay together on the inside of that atom. They are in the middle, okay, in the nucleus. Whereas the electrons are virtually weightless and high energy. So they're like flying around on the outside of the atom. So they're flying around the outside, whereas the protons and neutrons sit in the middle, okay? So uh, protons and neutrons, protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus, whereas the electrons are found in energy shells around the nucleus. They're flying all around the outside. Now, let me say something I, I just said one more time. Protons and neutrons also have mass. That means they have a weight to them. Electrons are considered weightless. But protons and neutrons have mass. Now, you can't measure this in pounds or grams or anything ridiculous like that. They're way too light. So the way that we measure the weight of protons and neutrons is we measure them in what are called atomic mass units. AMU, atomic mass units. AMU is atomic mass units. One proton weighs one atomic mass unit. Hey, One neutron weighs one atomic mass unit. How much does an electron weigh? Nothing. They are considered weightless. All right. So protons and neutrons have weight. They have mass. They weigh one atomic mass unit each. <clears throat> and they are located in the nucleus. Electrons are weightless. And they're flying all around the outside of the atom. They are in electron shells on the outside. Now, last but not least, we need to talk about the charges of these. Protons, neutrons, and electrons, there is variation in the charge that they see. Protons, protons will always display a positive. Protons are positive. Protons display a positive charge. Neutrons are neutral. Neutral. Neutrons are neutral. They display no charge. And electrons display a negative charge. Now, in nature, all atoms are electrically balanced for our purposes. Okay, when they're stable, they're electrically balanced. So what that means is, if it's got five protons, which display a positive charge, it's going to have five electrons that display a negative charge. Okay, they're going to have to be balanced out. Okay, they want to be balanced out. If it's got three positively charged protons, it's going to have to have three negatively charged electrons, and that is just how this works, okay? That's just how it works. Uh, yeah, perfect, perfect. Let's keep on rolling. Central nucleus, orbiting clouds, good. 
Now, in the world around us, about six elements make up the vast majority of our body, uh, most of which is oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Now, the oxygen and hydrogen should be pretty obvious to you. Why do we have so much hydrogen and oxygen in our system? Because what are we mostly made of? We are mostly made of water. And the chemical formula for water is H2O. Okay, so it's hydrogen and oxygen. If we're mostly water, that means we're mostly hydrogen and oxygen. And there it is. Now, why so much carbon? Uh, if you watch any sci-fi movies, you're going to hear it referred to that we are a carbon-based life form, as is all living things on this planet. A uh, carbon-based life form. Uh, what this means is all of our big molecules, our proteins, our um, nucleic acids, which make up our DNA, our lipids, our carbs, sugars, these are all built out of carbon. Okay, they're just big old carbon chains with a few other atoms here and there. But they're almost exclusively carbon. They're big old carbon molecules, so that's why we have so much carbon in our system. And that's really all, all I feel like saying about this. Now, let's see, I've got more about subatomic particles and their charge. Okay, we need to talk about an entry on the periodic table. Here's a good old-fashioned periodic table. Here we can see an entry for boron, B for boron. Okay, in this you can see a 5 a B for boron, and then let's just say it's a 10, okay? What this is showing you is an atomic symbol, an atomic mass, and an atomic number. If I were you, I would draw lines in and say that the 5 is the atomic number, okay, it was actually already annotated here, like a 1 here for hydrogen is the atomic number. The atomic symbol would be the B for boron, which I would never ask you to know what a B stands for in this particular case. And then the bottom number, the big number, is always the big number, is an atomic mass, okay? The atomic mass is the number on the bottom. The atomic number is the number on top. Now, <clears throat> what these mean, man, it's so simple. People struggle, but it is so, so simple. The atomic number, which is this number here, okay? The atomic number, this one here, that one there. The atomic number simply tells us the number of protons. Nothing else. Nothing fancy. The atomic number says, hey, carbon, atomic number six, six protons. Done. Finished. Okay, it's over. Whereas the atomic mass, the atomic mass, is a combined term. Okay, the atomic mass is the total count of protons and neutrons. So if we know that nitrogen has an atomic number of seven, that means that nitrogen has seven protons. But if its mass is 14, and the atomic mass is a com combination of protons and neutrons, well, hey, man, we can do some simple math and figure out how many neutrons there are in this atom. Atomic number 7 means there's 7 protons. Atomic mass is 14. So that means if there's 7 protons, how many neutrons do you have to have? 7 and 7, that's 14. It's just basic subtraction, okay, folks? Uh, look at oxygen. Oxygen has 8 protons. 16 is an atomic mass, which means it has 8 protons and 8 neutrons. Uh, here is neon. It's got 10 protons. Atomic mass is 20, so that means there's 10 protons 10 neutrons. Simple. Simple. Now, ignore all the percentage points here. We're not going to get into that. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, you can also interpret the number of electrons from this. Because remember, in nature, these are electrically balanced, right? So if nitrogen has seven protons, then how many electrons must it have to be electrically balanced? Seven positively charged protons means it's got to have seven negatively charged electrons floating around there somewhere. Okay, for it to be electrically balanced, it has to do it. Uh, here is, um, let's see if we can find a different kind of interesting one. No. Let's just do phosphorus. All right, here's 15. Okay, 15 protons. Its atomic mass is 30. So you know if it's got 15 protons, it's got to have 15 neutrons to make 30. Okay? If it's got 15 protons that are positively charged, how many negatively charged electrons does it need to be balanced? Well, if it's got 15 positively charged protons, it's going to have 15 negatively charged electrons. And that is just how that works, folks. Perfect. Okay, so atomic number, atomic mass, atomic symbol. Yeah, man. That works. That works just fine. Now let me ask you a question. All these atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons for the most part. Uh, so what makes them different? What makes them different is the numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons. 
Hydrogen has one proton. Carbon has six protons, six neutrons. Uh, well, let's not talk about electrons at this stage. Nitrogen, seven and seven. Oxygen, eight and eight. All right? That is how this works. They have different numbers of subatomic particles. And that's what makes these atoms act different in terms of their chemical reactivity. Okay? Their chemical reactivity is defined, basically, by the numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, I think it's worthwhile to have a little bit of a conversation on uh, how small atoms are. Okay? And the short answer here is that atoms are small. Okay? Uh, if an apple, imagine an apple in your hand, was magnified to the size of planet Earth, the atoms in that apple would be the size of the original apple on that planet. Does that make sense? In other words, atoms are very, very small. Very, very small indeed. Uh, I've also got a few more conversations to have here. Some kind of neat stuff that I think is worthy of conversation. Um, this is table salt, sodium chloride, table salt, sodium chloride, and this is sodium and this is chlorine. Chlorine is a gas and it's a terrifying gas. Uh, chlorine gas was used as a chemical warfare agent prior to the Geneva Convention back in the day. Uh, this stuff, if you breathe it in, it gets into your lungs and the chlorine chemically binds to the, uh, the water in the lungs basically and forms hydrochloric acid, okay, and it burns the lungs from the inside out. Just tears you to pieces. This is sodium, all right, sodium, sodium chloride, sodium chloride uh, for salt. Sodium is a metal and it's very, very volatile. In the presence of oxygen, it will melt. When placed in water, it will burn and explode, okay? But you bring together uh, chlorine and sodium and you make sodium chloride, table salt. Now, I have included here a YouTube link to a person burning some potassium. I would invite you to go and watch that. Just, just copy this and paste it into your browser. I think it's worthy of your time just to learn how crazy volatile some of these alkali metals are. They're, they're very fascinating. Um, and then last but not least here, this is a raw diamond in coal. Okay, Both of these are made exclusively of carbon. Exclusively of carbon. Uh, but the arrangement of the carbon atoms means that they are, in fact, quite different in appearance and function. Different in appearance and function. All right, and let's see, what else do I want to say? Good. All right, atoms are small. Just one more quick comment. Uh, so atoms are very small. There's a, about 30 trillion red blood cells and a drop of blood. So here's a drop of blood. In that drop of blood, there'd be 30 trillion human red blood cells, which convey oxygen to your system. Each red blood cell has about 270 million hemoglobin molecules in it. There's a hemoglobin molecule. It's what's called a quaternary protein structure. There's one, two, three, four proteins bound together, each of which holding one iron molecule. And the iron molecules are what give uh, blood its red color, and uh, the iron actually carries the oxygen. Right? So 30 trillion red blood cells in a drop of blood. 270 million hemoglobin molecules in one red blood cell, and four iron atoms per hemoglobin. One, two, three, four. So then, how many iron atoms are there in 30 trillion red blood cells? What would that be, like four times 270 million times 30 trillion? In other words, there is a lot of atoms in a drop of blood, okay? A lot of atoms in a drop of blood. So, so then, how big are these atoms? These atoms are small, man. Atoms are very, very, very small. Um, yes, good. All right, so let's talk about the periodic table. I tell you, I feel like we've already talked about most of this. I'm pretty satisfied with where we're at. So we've already gone through atomic number and atomic mass. We've already sort of gone through and discussed how the atoms are different. Uh, we've already kind of talked about some of these... Uh, here is diamond, graphite, and carbon of various forms. You can see the way the changes line up. Uh, that's how these are different. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with all that. Uh, let's talk about isotopes and ions real quick. Yeah. So isotopes, isotopes. These are going to be atoms that have weirdly various numbers of neutrons. Okay? So, for instance, carbon in its natural state 
is carbon 12. All right, 6 and 12, this is going to have 6 protons, 6 neutrons. Carbon 13 has a spare neutron. Carbon 14 has two spare neutrons. Um, this is just, you know, sometimes we see this in the world around us. There are, in fact, isotopes that have varying numbers of neutrons. Okay, it's just the way the world works. And sometimes it really changes the way that the atoms function. Like here's hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium. These are all variations of hydrogen. Good old-fashioned hydrogen actually lacks neutrons. Deuterium has a neutron. And then tritium has two neutrons. And it causes uh, hydrogen to work very differently when it starts binding up different numbers of neutrons. For instance, uh, standard hydrogen is what was filling the, um, oh man, Hindenburg, there it is. The Hindenburg when it burned, we think that the hydrogen played a role in the burning of the Hindenburg. Uh, deuterium is uh, used to make what's referred to as heavy water. You make water out of hydrogen with spare neutrons. It's called heavy water, like it's literally got double the weight. And we use heavy water for the manufacture of H-bombs, hydrogen bombs, nuclear bombs. Uh, and then if you add two neutrons to hydrogen, it becomes tritium. And tritium is what we use to load watch faces uh, to give them a glowing aspect. They actually absorb uh, UV radiation and re-emit it in darkness, which is kind of crazy. So isotopes they can act differently, but typically they just have different numbers of neutrons. And then, all right, and then there are ions. Uh, ions are present when there is a gain or loss of electrons. All right, it's very simple. Think about it like this. Uh, what's the charge on an electron? Electrons are negatively charged. And so if a atom were to gain an electron, if an atom gains a negatively charged electron, that atom will become overall negatively charged. Okay? Uh, it doesn't gain a proton with it. It just gains an electron. Ergo, it becomes negatively charged overall, or what we call anionic. Okay? If it loses an electron, so an atom is stable, it kicks off an electron, that means there's more protons than electrons now, so the atom becomes overall positively charged. These would be referred to as cations. Cations. All right, so if it gains or loses an electron, it's an ion. If it's got a random number of neutrons, it is an isotope. And uh, that brings up the concept, I guess, of ionizing radiation. Let's talk a little bit about this. So one of the scary things about radiation is it is, in fact, ionizing. Uh, radiation can cause an atom or molecule to start kicking off electrons. And as this flows through, we're kicking off electrons left and right, and these electrons are flowing through, doing damage. Uh, what can happen is you can destroy tissues in your own system. A really nice example of this shown here with a peach. Here's a standard good old-fashioned peach. And then if you blast this with ionizing radiation, it just the whole thing just liquefies, man. It just turns to parts and pieces. Uh, we do this when we treat um, uh, people for cancer as well. So radiation treatments, what we're doing is we're blasting radiation in and destroying tumors or cancerous cells of one form or another. Okay, so that is how this works. Yeah, that's good enough for me. Uh, and, you know, speak of uh, radiation, can't not talk about Marie Curie. So Marie Curie is probably like top five smartest humans that ever lived. She was an absolute genius and is sort of like the mother of uh, radiation concept and theory. Uh, like nobody does this sort of thing anymore. It's so wild. So Curie uh, received two Nobel Prizes in her time. Like, let me explain something to you, your folks. Like a Nobel Prize, this is when you work your whole life and you uh, are credited with a major discovery and it's changed the world. So before you die, they chuck a Nobel Prize at you. Okay? Curie got two Nobel Prizes in different forms of science, one in physics and one in chemistry. That is unheard of by today's standards. Um, basically discovered the concepts of radioactivity, uh, discovered radium. Uh, she ended up dying from radiation poisoning because she used to do a bunch of uh, unshielded x-rays before they fully understood how dangerous radiation was. Uh, she was on the freaking battlefields in World War I running x-rays for soldiers. I mean, this lady's hardcore. Genius and fearless. And speaking of which, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Freaking Marie Curie, man. What a genius. All right. Uh, electrons and energy. What do I want to say here? 
Yeah, yeah. That's all good stuff. Let's just jump down here. Uh, electrons determine chemical behavior of atoms. Fact. Electron relationships determine atomic relationships. Fact. And electrons are the basis for chemical bonding. Fact. Now, let me put this to you in English. If two atoms come together, what part interacts? Okay, here's an atom, and then let's say we have an adjacent atom. If they become closer together, what's going to interact first? The electrons will. Okay, the electrons, the numbers of electrons and their placement determine chemical bonding and the capacity, if you will, for chemical bonding. So the electrons are very important in establishing these relationships. So let's talk about it. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail here, but what I am going to say is this. The outermost electron shell, the one on the outside, is considered its valent shell. There could be a heck of a lot of electron shells, folks, but the one on the outside is always called the valent shell. And it's the valent shell where chemical bonding occurs. Okay? The valence shell is where chemical bonding occurs. Now, for our purposes, the first valent shell... No, let me just change this. We're going to talk about atoms in terms of only having two electron shells. We're not going to go way up the chart. We're going to stay at the, at the other side, okay, at the simple side. The first energy shell can hold a maximum of two electrons. Once it gets two electrons, it's happy. No more electrons in that first energy shell. The second energy shell, the second one, the second one can hold a maximum of eight electrons. Eight electrons. No more, no more than that. No more than that. Two in the first shell, eight in the second, and that's as high as we're going to go. So let's talk about valent shells and how they relate to chemical bonding. Here's helium. Helium has two electrons, one, two, in its first energy shell. Its valent shell has two electrons. And how many can that first shell hold? Two. Ergo, this sucker is stable. It is non-reactive. It doesn't bond to other things. Here is neon. Neon has one, two in the first shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the second shell. Eight. It's got eight in its second energy shell. It is full. It is happy. This atom is stable. It is non-reactive. These are considered noble gases. They don't react with other things. But then look at carbon. Carbon has two electrons in its first shell and four in its second. How many does it need to be happy? It's got four. How many does it need? It needs to have eight. It wants eight to be stable. And because of this, carbon is capable of bonding to other atoms. Here's oxygen. Oxygen has two in the first shell, six in the second. How many more electrons does it want to become stable? It's got six. How many does it need? Eight. Six, seven, eight. It needs two more to become electrically stable. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take these reactive elements and we're going to look at how they are capable of bonding to one another. And the short answer here is they're capable of bonding using ionic bonds and covalent bonds. All right, ionic and covalent. All right, um, you know, I feel like it's pertinent to throw these terms at you. It's irritating to me, but all the same worthy. Uh, the term molecule and compound, your book defines this terribly, and I use the book definition on the form of the PowerPoint you have. It is incorrect from my perspective. The real definition of a molecule versus a compound is as follows. A molecule is when you have two of the same element bound together. A compound is when you have two different elements bound together. So, like, molecular oxygen is what we breathe. That would be O2. Uh, a compound would be something like carbon dioxide, which is CO2. More than one different type of atom, the same atom. Now then, let me say this too. <laughs> I'm real bad at this. I am not a chemist. I am going to use the terms molecule and compound interchangeably, probably because I just like to say molecule. Okay, so prepare yourselves. I told you what their definitions are. Probably not going to be on your test, but... I will constantly move around which term I use. Just know that this is a fact. 
Now, I will ask you to understand the concept of a chemical formula. The chemical formula tells you how many atoms there are of uh, different elements within a compound. Okay? For instance, C6H12O6. C6H12O6, that is the formula for sugars. Okay? That is the formula for sugar. Good old, like, glucose, man. Let me tell you, that is C6H12O6. Now, what the heck does that mean? C6 means there's six carbon atoms. H12 means there's 12 hydrogens, and O6 means that there are six oxygens. C6H12O6. CO2. One carbon, two oxygens. H2O. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. Chemical formulas tell you a lot about what's found in that compound. Popular. All right. Now, in the, wor in the realm of chemical bonding, let's start out simple and do ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are formed from <clears throat> ions, okay? So how does this work? Here is sodium. What you need to know about sodium is it's got two electrons in its first shell, eight in its second shell, and then a spare. It's got another electron hanging out in its valence shell. Its valence shell is going to have one very loosely held electron. Here is chlorine. Chlorine is packed with electrons, man. And what you need to know is it needs one more electron in its valence shell to become stable. It really needs it, man. It wants that electron real bad. There is such a strong affinity for an electron in chlorine that it thieves away the electron from sodium. It takes it. That electron leaves sodium and becomes permanently fixed to chlorine. Now, what's the charge on an electron? Negative. So if chlorine gains an electron, it becomes overall negatively charged. Now, sodium was stable uh, electrically. It was stable. But it lost an electron. And electrons are negatively charged. So if it loses one, sodium becomes overall positively charged. Positively charged sodium, negatively charged chlorine. Like your grandma used to say, man, opposites attract. These two atoms will stick together now like magnets. They stick together like magnets. That's an ionic charge. Or, I'm sorry. That's an ionic bond, I should say. That is an ionic bond. Salt. Good old-fashioned table salt. Sodium chloride? Yeah, man. That's an ionic bond. Uh, this is a loose form of bonding. These atoms do not hold together tightly. Uh, you can see this quite clearly by taking a little bit of salt and putting it in water, and the salt sort of dissociates. It goes away. It becomes not salt anymore. Um, that's because the water actually breaks up the sodium and chlorine from one another. And then if you boil the water away, they come back together and stick like magnets, yet again becoming salt. So yeah, man, that's how this works. It's a neat system. Then there are covalent bonds. Now, in the realm of covalent bonds, there are two forms that I want to talk about here. Nonpolar covalent and polar covalent. Polar covalent, nonpolar covalent. And this is very simple, okay? A nonpolar covalent bond, well, hang on, first things first. Anytime you say covalent, a covalent bond is where the electrons become shared. Here, in ionic bonds, uh oh in ionic bonds, the electron is stolen away. In covalent bonds, the electrons are shared. They are shared between the molecule or shared between the atoms, you might say. A nonpolar covalent bond, they share the electrons equally. The electrons spend no more time around one spot than the other. So the whole molecule is electrically stable, as stable as it can be. Okay? It is electrically stable. The whole thing's stable. A polar covalent bonding system, a polar covalently bonded molecule, the electrons spend more time at one spot than the rest. For instance, water. The electrons spend more time around oxygen than they do around the hydrogens. And because of that, the oxygen side, the electrons are just hanging out there all the time, the oxygen side becomes negatively charged. It displays a mild negative charge on that side of the molecule. Whereas the, the hydrogen side, because the electrons aren't there very often, they become 
positively charged. They display a positive charge because the electrons aren't hanging out there very much these days. It's all protons down here. And protons are positively charged. Ergo, this side of this compound actually uh, displays a positive charge, whereas the electrons are always up north here. So it will display a negative charge because the electrons display negative charges. Yeah, it's called electronegativity. So the oxygen molecule here displays a strong, what's referred to as electronegativity. Ergo, it's um, going to be mildly negatively charged. Electronegativity. The electrons hang out there more so than elsewhere. Good. Okay, good. And uh, because of water's polarity, this causes water to display an interesting side effect. Now, let me say this again. Because of water's polar covalent bonding. It causes water to display a fascinating side effect. And this fascinating side effect is referred to as hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. Now what the heck am I getting at? One water molecule attracts to other water molecules. All right, Water molecules attract to one another because the positively side our positively charged side of this one will attract to the negatively charged side of that one. The positively charged side of this one attracts to the negatively charged side of that one. The negatively charged side of this one attracts to the, you, get, you get my point? This makes water molecules have a weak attraction to one another. And we call this hydrogen bonding. Okay, hydrogen bonding. It's what allows this water strider to stand on the surface tension of this pond. Those water molecules are attracted to one another strong enough that this very lightweight organism can actually stand on top of the tension they generate. This is also why, as Grandma would say, oil and water doesn't mix. Water is polar covalently bonded, ergo it displays positive and negative charges, whereas oil molecules are polar, or I'm sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong. Oil molecules are nonpolar. They are nonpolar covalent. They're like this. And because one's polar covalent and the other one is nonpolar covalent, they are chemically incapable of bonding to one another. All right, chemically incapable of bonding. Uh, and this is very important. You see hydrogen bonds all over the place in the human system and in other living things as well. So, um, like your DNA, the way that your DNA forms its double helix, it's held together with hydrogen bonds, weak attractions between molecules. Proteins in your system, uh, you got like your skin is made out of mostly protein, and those proteins are in unique shapes using hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds drive our whole system, and because you're mostly made out of water, uh, and water is hydrogen bonding to one another, it's capable of hydrogen bonds. Water is non, or I'm sorry, water is polar covalently bonded. Uh, this causes the uh, basic unique characteristics of water to represent you as you having unique characteristics. Now let me spell this out a little different way. Because of water and its weak attractions, its hydrogen bonding, because of the way that water molecules attract one another, it gives water some unique characteristics. And because water has unique characteristics and you are mostly made of water, this gives you some unique characteristics. So let's go through and talk about those. All right, properties of water. Water has a high heat capacity. Uh, what that means is it takes a lot of energy influx to make water change temperature. Okay, um, it, it really does, man. You gotta you gotta pile the heat into water to make it augment its temperature. And you know this because you've had to boil water before. You sit there and you stare at it for what seems like an eternity, and it never gets there. Okay, it takes a long time for water to heat up. Or, alternatively, it takes a long time for water to cool down. And that's good for you because you can take your handsome little dog out in the snow and you guys can run around and act like crazy people and have a great time and not die from hypothermia. When it was freaking cold recently, I, uh, you know, put some shoes on, wore my shorts and a t-shirt, and drug my trash out to the road and then came back inside. I did not collapse and die from hypothermia. And the reason for that is very simple. You are mostly made out of water. And it takes a lot of heat loss, a lot of energy loss to heat for your body's core temperature to change. You are very thermally stable. Okay, you're pretty thermally stable because water has a high heat capacity. 
All right, water has a high heat of evaporation. Uh, what this means is that it takes a lot of heat to make water change states from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas or what have you, okay? Uh, for water to boil, there is a massive amount of heat that has to get into it, a massive amount of energy that has to get into it. And what that means is that your evaporative cooling mechanism works fantastically well. All right, it's getting pretty warm outside right now. Uh, the heat of June in Alabama, the heat of July, boy, let me tell you, it's going to be blistering hot outside. But you can go jump in a pool, and when you get out of that water, you're going to feel like you're freezing to death. Because the water is boiling off your system in massive quantities, pulling body heat out of you, and you're going to feel like you're going to hypothermic. You'll start shivering. You'll get really cold really fast. Uh, when you get hot and you sweat, and that sweat boils off your system, what it's doing is it's evaporatively cooling you. It's keeping your body temperature down uh, so that you don't overheat and die of a heat stroke. Yeah, yeah, evaporative cooling. Sweating is an example of this. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, water's a good solvent, that's a fact. So uh, when we make or break down things in our gut, or when we're building things for our system, like the... vacuum. Okay, moving on. Uh, when we make or break things with our bodies, we always use water. All of our digestive processes and all of our making of new particles from digested particles, uh, it's all done using water. It's always done using water. There's two terms that you need to be aware of here. These are hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Wait a second. Let's not jump ahead. Let's keep this simple. Okay, let's keep this simple. Uh, water is a good solvent. It's good at breaking things up. And you know this because at some stage in your life, uh, you've probably made like Kool-Aid or something. You can take a big jug of water, pour the Kool-Aid in and just walk away. And if you come back in a few hours, it's going to look like Kool-Aid without you ever having stirred it. Uh, it's because water molecules are very good at getting in between uh, bits of other molecules and breaking them up into pieces, okay? Uh, there's a term set here you need to know. These are solution and solute. A solution is a fluid. A solute is a particle. Uh, in our example of Kool-Aid, the solute is the Kool-Aid. The solution is water. And uh, that's more or less good enough for me. Let's briefly mention hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophilia. Hydrophilic means water-loving. These are going to be particles which are uh, polar covalent. They are going to be attracted to water. Hydrophobic would be molecules that are non-polar covalent. They would be molecules that are not attracted to water. So, <coughs> uh, what we have here is oil particles that are non-polar covalent. Uh, these would be considered hydrophobic. Yeah, so just know those terms. Very important. And water has a high degree of cohesion and adhesion. Now let me explain what that, we, that means. Cohesion means that water likes to bond to other water molecules, and adhesion is that water likes to stick to other things. Uh, this is one of the ways that water can get up a tree into its leaves. The water gets into the, the venous system of the tree, just like you have arteries and veins. Trees have similar structures called xylem and phloem. Uh, and those water molecules get in there, they stick together, the water molecules stick together, they stick to the walls of the vascular system of this plant, and they slowly climb up into the leaves. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. Uh, so cohesion, water molecules like to stick together, and adhesion, water molecules like to stick to other things. For example, I can stick my finger in my water glass here, and you can see there I've got a little bit of water stuck to the end of my finger. That is water molecules, see them? You can see them. They are co co displaying cohesion. They are stuck to one another, and they are displaying adhesion because they are sticking to my fingers. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, let's see, frozen water is less dense than liquid water. This is a really important point for sustaining life on the planet. Uh, when water freezes, okay, water molecules are actually very close to one another when water is liquid, but when water freezes, it expands. Okay, it expands to form a crystalline structure, and when it does this, it actually becomes less dense than liquid water. Frozen water, when it freezes, expands. Don't believe me? Go get you a water bottle, fill it to the top with hot water, put it, you know, seal it off, and then chuck it in your freezer and watch what happens. Okay, when it freezes, it's going to blow that bottle to pieces because the water expands outwardly. All right, so uh, what this means, again, when it forms this crystalline structure is that ice is less dense 
than liquid water. And the basics of that is that ice floats on the surface. And that's a wonderful thing uh, because it keeps life on the planet, basically, when it's very cold. Uh, the reason the Great White North, if you will, doesn't reset every year in terms of animal life is par partially because of this system, all right? Um, the idea is this. When water freezes, the top of a lake, for example, when the ice forms at the top of this lake, like with this, I, the horse is standing on here, it doesn't get that thick, actually. I mean, there are some places where it gets relatively thick, you know, but normally not that thick because the ice then acts like a greenhouse and keeps heat in the water below. In fact, the temperature, you know, a few feet down in a lake, really doesn't change that much in the course of a year. The ice will shield it from becoming very, very cold underneath. And what that means is that fish and other species that utilize that water, uh, they will be just fine. They will be just fine. Yeah. Yeah, that works pretty well. It, the ice shields underlying water from freezing. The ice works like a jacket. It's an insulator to prevent underlying water from freezing, and that keeps uh, fish and things of that nature alive in these lakes during extremely cold conditions. Perfect. Uh, is this last but not least? It is. Okay, so uh, your book throws this in, The Search for Life on Other Planets, and I think it's kind of a fun conversation, so we'll have it. Um, we are under the impression that life cannot exist elsewhere unless liquid water exists elsewhere. All life on our planet, it requires water for survival. Okay, we just know this is fact on our planet, and we are egocentric, ergo life elsewhere must have water to survive. So the question becomes, how do we look for life elsewhere? Well, the first thing we do is we look for liquid water, or water generally. Now, let me throw a few of them at you. Let's, let's look at some neat stuff. Titan is a moon of Saturn, and boy does that look like Earth. But these liquid oceans are not liquid oceans of water. They're liquid oceans of things like methane and ammonia, okay? Uh, very not fun chemicals for you to be immersed in. Super cold liquid methane, man. This is super, super cold. But there are liquid oceans on Titan, just not water oceans like what we are used to. Uh, here is Europa. Europa is kind of fascinating, okay? So um, Europa, being that it's in the gravitational field of Jupiter, you ever get silly putty and play with it? You'll notice that when you first pick it up and it's cold, it's hard, but after you play with it a little, a little bit and it warms up, it becomes quite malleable. Because Europa is in the gravitational field of Jupiter, Jupiter has got such a crazy mag uh, magnetic field that it kind of needs Europa and keeps Europa warm. Okay, It kind of causes all the molecules in Europa to be constantly in flux, and it causes Europa to be unduly warm for that part of our solar system. And uh, what we have seen is geysers of liquid water. There's liquid water on Europa blasting off the surface. So when Jupiter squeezes this planet, it blows off geysers of water. And we have flown through that trying to find microbes. Like we have sent space, spacecraft through the ice uh, that's blown off the surface there uh, and tried to locate living things within this. I'm not sure how successful they've been, but we have sent probes to Europa before. It's an amazing thing. And uh, then, obviously, last but not least, we have to talk about Mars. Mars has obviously had liquid water in the past. They have deltas. Looks just like Egypt. Um, there is clearly liquid water on Mars a long, long time ago. Uh, but because of the solar wind and the lack of gravitational field around Mars, because it's very small, it's all that water has been blown away. The atmosphere of Mars has been blown away, and the solar wind has carried all of its liquid water with it. Uh, but there are some pockets and weird spots on the planet that the solar wind does not do this to, and a good example is here. This is an impact crater on the southern cap of the planet, and it's full of ice. That sucker's full. It's snow, man. You could hop on that and you'd think you're in Antarctica. It looks just the same. Uh, there is, There are ice caps. There is ice. Uh, and prospectively, there, NASA says that they have located some underground wells of liquid water. So it's going to be kind of neat in the future to burrow some spacecraft into there and see who's home. It's going to be a neat, neat thing. 
All right, and uh, that's got it for me, folks. So I hope you enjoyed it. And you can expect a quiz popping up on this relatively soon. Have a great day. Enjoy.